as a planet, as a race, we're doing extremely well. And we're doing so well that it, if you look at the future, we've laid the foundation by any dimension or any definition that we are going to take leaps and bounds. Scenario number five might be understating it. How many of you have heard of 3D printing? Raise your hands. Okay, about a third of the room. 3D paint printing basically allows us to manufacture whatever we want to from a machine that looks like a printer, and you can see a picture of it, and using any base material like plastics or titanium or what have you, you can create any object you want to from all open source code. Today, you can go and buy one of these machines for $2,200 at MakerBot. They're not a client, I'm not advertising for them, in Manhattan that allows you to print in your home whatever object you can get open source code for using the base materials that they provide. Think what it's going to do to manufacturing. Today, you can get your own genetic code scan done for under $1,000. And there's a handheld device available now to do all sorts of tests on you that you can do a self-analysis. I've actually seen a machine that now has started 3D printing of medicines and drugs. You will now be able to self-prescribe. What's going to happen to the FDA? I don't know. But you will be able to manufacture your own devices. Think about it. Today, an 83-year-old woman got her entire jaw replaced with a titanium jaw that works and was printed on a 3D machine. 83-year-old woman suffering from oral cancer. This stuff is it's, it's happening so fast, it's around the corner. It's actually in front of our eyes. But because we're overwhelmed with all this information, we don't see it happening. Think about it from a perspective of the massive amount of technology advances. Now, you look, you know, we say our biggest problem is water and food, right? Nanotechnology membranes now exist at virtually zero energy costs to desalinize water. It's just a matter of now commercially making it available. You'll be able to put it on your taps. So you can pump seawater through your taps and you'll get potable water at the other end. Vertical food, vertical farming. Experimentation has now begun where you can actually grow and farm on existing buildings. It's 90% less land, 90% less water, no pesticides, and about seven buildings in Manhattan is sufficient to service that entire population. Transportation costs will be roughly zero. Existing buildings can be converted. These technologies are now starting to take hold. So we've solved the problem of food and water. What about energy? The picture here is Craig Venter. He's the guy who decoded the human, de the human genome faster than the US government could. He's now working on a biosynthetic fuel that allows energy to be created while the organisms pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, simultaneously cooling down the planet while creating energy, actually to inverting the entire energy pyramid around. And this is now working. It's just a question of commercializing some of this stuff. The smart grid systems that exist today have, are, are use, is using less energy, using less energy by a factor of three, based on what we have seen from the past. So the dramatic increases that we have seen are just phenomenal. Let's take, let's take, a, I remember World Conference number one. Let's take the basic technologies that we use and think about that for a moment. I remember saying that we would have a device that would be the size of a big book that we could access the world from. I was wrong. The iPad is one sixth the size of a big book. And that was, that's what, six years later, Seventh World Conference? Today, I know people that have RFID tags that are actually inserted under the skin, allowing them to access the net with a jawbone speaker and phone right under their ear. They don't need the device anymore. And for those of us that say, ooh, I won't let that happen to me, that's nasty. We have pacemakers. We have contact lenses. We are inserting. We will do anything to make ourselves superior than an average human. 
What was the fastest selling drug in acceptance in human society? Does anyone know the answer to that? Viagra. You got it. You, he's not a user, but he got it, okay? <laughs> Superhuman male performance. No longer taboo. We accept it. Bioethics says we shouldn't allow ourselves to get below beyond superhuman. Who defines it? And so when we think about us being able to access ourselves on a continuous basis without carrying any devices, what's that going to mean to our future? Is all these changes starting to evolve and they're happening pretty fast. What's going to stop us from getting to this point of nirvana? And my argument is there's only one major risk we face. There is only one major risk we face, and that is meaningful jobs. And let me explain why. Every problem that society has had has been solved by human ingenuity, innovation, or some smart decision making. We as people have solved every one of our problems to allow us to sit in this room and partake in this discussion. But the one problem that is now emerging that is very dramatic is the notion of meaningful jobs. So let's just think about that for a moment. We worked to survive as we started developing as a species. We were hunters and gatherers, and then became a bit of farmers. Then what we did was defining not who we were, but a source of income. We were then blacksmiths or priests, or whatever ways we could to contribute to society. Today, our jobs are who we are. It explains the interracial marriages, because those are the people you run into and get most likely to get married to. It defines who we are in terms of our place in society. And what we are doing to ourselves as far as jobs go is got a tremendous amount of risk. We are dehumanizing certain jobs. We are creating this notion of dirty jobs. We have done all these things to ourselves that is really changing the way we're looking at it. And this room here is the most powerful group of people that can bring about that change. So when you take a step back and you say, if I think about nation states warring today, and I really look at the root cause of problem, it's always a war around jobs. If I look at the debts due to hostilities, it's the intranational conflicts that's killing the youth. If the male youth has got more than 30% unemployment, social strife will follow, Spain being the most recent example. If we allow the lack of meaningful jobs to overtake us, it's scenario one, because the technology already exists. We're smart enough to figure all those other things out, that there will be a major schism in society that will then create so much strife that we will be unable to overcome it. However, when we think about it for a moment, the answers are with us. Job formation takes place in three major areas, innovation, wise fiscal policy, and entrepreneurialism. And it's well established that those three pillars of job growth are sufficient for the ever-expanding population. Over the last 50 years, approximately 75% of the new jobs were created by for-profit enterprises. So it's your organizations that have created this sense of stability and almost utopia of the world that we live in. So what do I do? What do I do as an HR professional? How can I bring about a difference? And I would argue there's three things you can do. The first one is to understand the impact of jobs and work in your own organization. If you take the average S&P 500 company, the amount of money spent on jobs, on people and people-related expenses has climbed from 52 to 56%. The 4% increase that you see, only 3% is increase in real wages. The other 1% has been due to poorer processes, unsustainable scaling, and things of that sort. 
that you can bring about changes. And that makes up 15, 10% of your profits. If you can figure that out and plow that money back into R&D, there will be more job creation that will come in. And that innovation will continue to drive us at a faster pace. And you can bring about that change. You can use various smarter workforce techniques that are quite dramatic, and a lot of them exist currently. Pulling it together, being creative, innovative around it, can bring about dramatic changes into your financial statements. The second thing you can do is remove this notion and mentality that exists in the youth today, and to a certain extent beyond the youth, people in the 30s and 40s, this notion of this job is beneath me. The perfect example is a trash collector. Who wants to be a trash collector? Well, the trash collector is the number one reason why we're leading such healthy lives. Because the work that they are doing is reducing the communicable diseases in our neighborhood that is then allowing us to lead such wonderful lives. There is no job that's beneath us. And it's a very hard notion to push into the mind of a 25-year-old. But you are interviewing those people as they're entering into the workforce. We have to, as a society, eliminate this notion of dirty jobs. They don't exist. They all have meaning and purpose. The third thing that you can be extremely effective in doing is stopping this dehumanization that is taking place in the commoditized jobs. The invisible people that serve us are being dehumanized at an accelerated rate. They're losing their dignity and place in society. And because we can replace them like we can replace a nut or a bolt, we think they're worthless. The answer is no. We've got to allow and regain that dignity. In using smarter workforce techniques, we now have the social and technology components that allow us to access and touch all these people. The battles that the governments and nation states are fighting around job creation, poor governance is a ma ma massive issue around the world. Look at the way right now we're going through an election in this country. It's the lowest common denominator battles that are taking place. They're not meaningful conversations. We all say we need more jobs, but nobody's really got a plan in action for it. We can bring about those changes. We can humanize and make these jobs significant. We can have, we do have the tools, we can have the tools to create the smarter workforce. And over the next couple of days, I'm hoping and expecting that people will be able to think about these things, work on them, and really truly not only change your place in society, but your place on the broader scope of humanity.